at CNN and at BBC. And the truth move will be somewhere in between all those because no one's got a monopoly on it. And that's precisely you know, what's behind um, the new channel I've launched, which is uh, TVC. It's the first pan-African channel. Our tagline is Through African Eyes because Africans, for the first time, want to see the world from their perspective. They don't want to see it from CCTVs, Al Jazeera, or CNN African Eyes, which we would call kind of South African Eyes. So you're very close to Arnold in your, in, your, in, your, in your approach, actually. Certainly closer, and I don't believe in all this hegemony stuff. I can watch NDTV and TV Today in London. There's plenty of Indian stuff around. There's endless Punjabi channels and Hindi channels. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I don't buy that argument at all. And you don't, by definition, um, buy the argument of the distinguished BBC correspondent uh, John Simpson, who, uh, who, 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 said, who said that um, that the British media, and by, and by extension the Western media, was grotesquely selective in their view of news. You think people are just interested mostly in what's happening around the corner? I don't think. Uh, I mean, the idea of a kind of global media capital is kind of terrifying to me in terms of of uh, m monopoly of information. I, I, I do think, honestly and truly, that, I mean, if you look at BBC World compared to BBC Domestic Channel, they're quite a different agenda. They're playing to a different audience. Um, we want to know about our taxes going up far more than, you know, things that are happening, maybe a flood in China. Um, that's just the way the world is. But you don't want... You're not aspirational that the world should be different. You say that is how the world is. It might be how the world is now, but is there something more idealistic to look forward to? I'm, I'm, more I'm, share, more I'm, sharing, I'm certainly not values. aspirational for you know, everyone to be the same, wear the same clothes, eat the same food, have the same views, and all the same information. It sounds like a nightmare to me. You know, I say people are different, and I love going to exotic places um, because they are exotic and different. Margarita, what has changed in the last uh, 10 years in terms of, clearly you have established yourself, clearly you have, you have had a considerable degree of success, but what has changed in terms of perspective? Do we see international news in a different way than 10 years ago? Yes, I um, do think so. And the numbers that our friend here from PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, kindly gave us um, actually say the same thing. What they're saying, if I remember that correctly, that 10 years ago, uh, on average, a person would use two sources of information to get the news from, and now it's more than four. Now, why is it so? Well, first of all, because more news sources have been established. But also, I think, so I might be wrong, but uh, my feeling is that that's because uh, people m realize more and more that there is much more to be said about the world than their traditional sources of information are telling them. People are realizing that other sources might, that are available to them might tell them stories that they find fascinating, interesting, important, and completely different to what they had been used to hearing from their traditional sources. And that is the main change that we are seeing right now in the world of information. In, uh, yeah, in, 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 indeed it is. Do you, do you, do you feel the same? Um, do you feel the same about this, that something important has changed because of the existence of these channels? Definitely, definitely. I think that the most important thing that has changed is this, this feeling and the amount of people that, that find themselves thinking, and that amount of people is growing day by day in the world, thinking that, well, this might not be the whole truth. Let me check some other source to find some other side of the story. I think that 10 years ago, uh, not so many people actually ever thought of that. That, that. that mere thought that this might not be the whole truth did not occur to a lot of people because they were so used to their traditional media sources and the traditional media sources were so trusted that it wouldn't even occur to a large portion of the audience that, wait, 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 what did they say about Serbia? Well, maybe there's something more about Serbia and maybe there's an alternative view that I should know before I form my opinion. This is the main thing that has changed.
What is your perspective, Lou, from CCTV? Do you, do you see that something important is changing out there in the behaviour and attitudes of viewers, and you are, and you are part of that change? Uh, actually, I still want to go back to the demands why people were so interested in this cross-border news. I think one concept is the globalization. I think probably 10 years or 15 years ago, uh, globalization is not that uh, big issue in big people's daily life. But now, I think globalization is linking everybody uh, together, like uh, we talk about the economy, the development economy. Uh, I still remember that when I was in the university, when I started to learn the journalism, people still talking, yeah, U.S. people just take care, just to think about uh, domestic things. They are not so care about the international thing. I don't know, uh, but so far, I don't think that U.S. people or any people in the world can still hold such kind of concept before, because if you don't take care of the, the others, the global event happened in the other country, it may just... Uh, affect your daily life, like the oil price, if there is a kind of a war in the Middle East, um, the oil price may just be falling, and if the kind of policy change in the uh, certain countries, I mean in Europe, the kind of immigration policy change, it may affect uh, different countries, different peoples. So I think this is uh, quite different, and this is basically, I think, the root of people, why so many people now are interested in uh, the international yeah. news then 10 years ago. Anna, uh, Nigel's concerned that as against the backdrop of globalization, you'll get homogenous, globalized news, that that's a danger, and it will be boring news. Is there, is there, is there a danger that, you, that, that your vision of the world might lead in that direction? It depends entirely on what you call boring. I find asymmetrical news boring. I find news that emanates only from certain world parts of the world boring. Now, so you Nigel makes... You agree with John Simpson. Yeah. There's a no, grotesque yeah. uh, selectiveness. I do, and I would like to substantiate it with three particular examples. We can go at the 80s, when Ronald Reagan described the Mujahideen as, you know, Rambo-type people who were simply fighting with handheld weapons against a foreign invader. And when he met the Mujahideen, and that was covered, and that is where the ISIS story goes back to. Have people actually looked back and connected the dots? They haven't. The point is, look at the Paris attacks and let's look at the coverage of the Paris attacks to answer your question. Yes. Here we are, the Paris attacks have generated a lot of global coverage up to the point where we have talked this morning about a global coalition to fight ISIS and why it cannot happen. You would know that on the 26th of November 2008, in the Mumbai attacks, 165 Indians were killed in four locations, in the Paris attacks it was one, by ten terrorists sent from Pakistan, and that was the greatest act of bloodshed which happened. I saw that, that was news covered, about, that was covered not, extensively no, all around no, the world. No, once, it was. They, once, they weren't. Its coverage is also, you've got to look at coverage in terms of whether you cover, or you cover with the intensity, passion, and for the length of time that you cover the Paris attacks. You see, we must be open in this forum. The point that I'm making is the Paris attacks generated universal outrage they should have done. And the scale of the attack has now prompted what is close to an international effort against ISIS. Before the ISIS, before there was Paris, when Mumbai was attacked, there weren't as many news outlets in the US or the UK who took up the job, and I'm not talking about coverage, of sanctions against Pakistan. And the reason for that is because the U.S. has been hand in glove with what is happening in Pakistan. Yes. I find it very surprising, and maybe people in this audience know, don't know about this particular story. If I were to tell you that the person who carried out the surveillance was one of the masterminds of the attacks in Mumbai, was an American citizen by the name of David Coleman Headley, who was not just an American citizen, he was an FBI double agent. An FBI double agent was the mastermind of the Mumbai attacks. He went over to the dark side and he was a double agent for both the Lashkar-e Toiba as well as... Just a minute. No, no, no. no, no, no let's, let's, just, let's, I, allow I, me to complete my no, point. I, I will let you put like no, point, but I want just to put in that we cannot deal with in great detail with historic no, no, conspiracy theories I, I'm just, on this platform. No, no, it's but not continue. a conspiracy yeah. theory. It's a very relevant point. I find it very surprising that only one American investigative journalistic portal called ProPublica did the story of David Coleman Headley. 
And the reason I'm highlighting it is, please consider, if today it was proven that there was a similar person responsible for the Paris attacks, what kind of coverage would that have got, as opposed to the coverage that this story got? Now we can say, how many American news outlets and British outlets have said, how can you get into a plea bargain with this particular individual? The point I'm making is one simple point. There is, I wouldn't say bias or prejudice, but there has been an asymmetry which perhaps, and I would give the benefit of doubt, stems from the locational prejudices that come in, that when things happen, when they are closer to you, you report it you know, in, in greater depth. When they happen away from you, you do report it, but not with the same intensity and passion. And I think that is one of the reasons today we need a balance of powers in the media world. Are we not confusing two things, domestic news services and international news services no. represented here today. Surely the asymmetry is not the same. There's a problem with domestic news services, I agree, but that is not what we're here to discuss today. No, I'm Surely talking about, I'm to, to, to clarify, I'm talking about global news sources. I'm not talking about okay. CNN domestic or BBC domestic. Okay. I'm talking about their global coverage and I find the gap between the way, way they covered Mumbai and the way they covered Paris. Okay. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense, Anna, you've, you've already addressed the problem, but maybe it just a greater length, does that, does that view chime with your daily working experience? My view. Yeah. Uh, so I would say I remember Mumbai incredibly well. Uh, it was sort of seven years ago, and in fact we marked the anniversary of it again this year, just when it, it um, uh, you know, just recently. But I remember the non-stop coverage we had on BBC World News, yeah. and I remember we, the, the people we sent out to cover it, I remember all those editorial dilemmas that we also went through because of the voices that came through from the people were calling from the hotel rooms, what do you report, what do you not report, the safety of those concerns. And I remember the safety of our teams there, and I remember not sleeping and being at work constantly over the, the number of days that it took. Because unlike Paris, it, it ran. You know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't over in a sort of an hour and a half in the sense of, of the, how the siege went on. But, um, and we obviously covered it quite extensively before then, the train, um, the attacks on the train station. But I do think it is there, you know, there's also obviously, I think, I think the other issue sometimes is an event in Mumbai, an event in Paris, they're taking place in a major capital city where, or New York or London or Madrid, where they're unfolding in front of your eyes. I think the ones that are so much harder are the events in Kano, the events in, you know, where... Where no know, journalists what, are safe. Where no journalists are safe, where no one is there, the ones you can't get to, that you know an atrocity is unfolding, but you cannot operate freely in those areas, you can't get to it. And they're the challenges I think we all face. And how do we do, how do, we do that? And I know, you know, Ni you know sort of certainly Nigeria is, is one of those major ones that we look at all the time and we struggle with. Anna, could you lead us in a slightly different direction, but one that flows directly out of the conversations this morning? The implication that the media and the international media are important and playing, could play an increasingly important role in matters of war and peace and informing people better. Do you, as a journalist, an editor, an executive, feel any responsibility for higher issues of war and peace or are you just getting the, the, the goddamn story out there? I think, you know, for me, the sort of mission is to inform, to gather information, to inform in, in an impartial um, as way as possible, but to gather the information and to put it out there. And, you know, hopefully by the fact of whether you're sitting in you know, some are in Downing Street or, or you're sitting in Delhi or you're sitting in, in, in China, wherever you are, that you're, whether you're both a politician and member of the military or a, just a concerned citizen, that actually the fact that you have that information and that that is available to you in some way, hopefully, influences events on the ground. So in the end, nobody wants to continue to see human suffering. Margarita, do you feel, as a journalist and an executive, any special responsibility beyond just covering the widest range of stories you think is relevant? The implication from, you know, from the general and the previous conversation is that the media has an important role to play and should play it better and more seriously. Absolutely. I absolutely do. And actually, I um, sometimes wonder, um, do the journalists whose work was mentioned today by my Indian colleague, the, you called them cheerleaders, didn't you? 
do the journalists who cheered for Iraq war and whose work partially actually did lead to Iraq war do they feel sorry do did they many, have, do did they ma- have did many journalists actually cheerleaders or just are re- just reporting the politicians in their society question mark no there were quite a lot of articles and, and quite a lot of pieces on the air that okay. were cheerleading okay. absolutely yeah. absolutely so I just, yeah. just once, once if I it's a short one a very short one the point she is making and I agree with her that the genuine belief is that it is only in a very diversified you know, media space that you can have a very serious discussion of the causes and the climate that has led to the situation in the Middle East today. And hence, if we are to truly examine what are the one of the factors, because domestic public opinion matters everywhere in the exactly. world. If there was domestic public opinion, since we cannot separate with respect what domestic channels do from what global channels do, because if the domestic channel is building up a certain sentiment in favor of a war, then inevitably there is less pressure on the government. Hence, we must examine whether the domestic channels also are asking the questions in as forthright a way. And if they don't, then one alternative is for channels like Russia today. Other channels, channels emerging from elsewhere in the world to broadcast right into the USA so that people there get a different perspective. That's exactly what we're doing. And if you let me continue, I often wonder whether those journalists feel responsibility, whether they are sorry, whether they have nightmares, whether they uh, do realize that their work contributed to a lot of people dying. And every day I question myself and I make myself think, what if what we are doing might lead to more bloodshed? We have to be very, very careful in what we are doing. Um, we, do, we are not broadcast in Russian. So domestic audiences in Russia do not watch us. We, we are not in Russian. Would it be a good idea if your view of an external world was broadcast in Russian? There's a to lot the of, Russian people. There's, there's a lot of channels in Russia that okay. in Russian and in Russia that.